Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Pharmacy for the People, where I try to put your health back into your hands by breaking down complex medical issues into bite-sized morsels. I'm your host, James. I'm a licensed practicing pharmacist. Let's get going. Today, I'm introducing a series on over-the-counter remedies for common maladies. Over-the-counter or OTC meds are all those medications that you can buy without needing to get a prescription first. They're all the meds on the shelves in front of the pharmacy counter that you can just pick up and buy. The reason you don't need a prescription for these is over-the-counter drugs are defined as drugs that are safe and effective for use by the general public without seeking treatment by a health professional, which means that all safe self-treatment using over-the-counter meds relies on relatively mild symptoms, uh, easily diagnosed conditions, and strict adherence to the directions that are on labels. But there are so many choices of over-the-counter meds. Which one should you use? Which one should you try? That's what What Can I Take for Blank series is all about. We're going to go through different uh, common issues that we all suffer from and talk about the over-the-counter medications that might help you along the way. Let me reiterate the warning that's part of the intro of this video is that this information is just for educational purposes. It's not for diagnostic purposes. Um, if, if you're experiencing the symptoms that I describe here and they aren't resolved using uh, over-the-counter medications the way that they're labeled for use, it, it's time to be seen by a doctor, right? Uh, also, I, I have no sponsors here, so any brand names that I mention, I, I'm not getting a kickback from. I'm not necessarily endorsing them, I'm just using their names, okay? Let's jump into it. This first video in the What Can I Take for Blank series is What Can I Take to Treat a Cold Using Over-the-Counter Meds. Okay, so what we usually refer to as a cold is actually a, a group of symptoms that are usually caused by rhinoviruses. Rhino referring to the nose. Get it? Rhinoceros horn? Rhino? Rhinosaurus? Huh? Anyway, rhinoviruses. There are over 200 different kinds of viruses that can cause what we refer to as the common cold. It can be uh, the respiratory syncytial virus, it can be uh, parainfluenza virus, adenovirus, or the common coronavirus. Uh, the, usually, uh, the infection usually self-resolves in 7 to 10 days. But of course, we all know the symptoms associated with a cold. You've got a stuffy nose, a running nose, you've got a sinus pressure, headache, a fatigue, you're, you're, you've got sore throat, uh, you might have a cough, you might be sneezing. We've all experienced it before. We know what to expect. But what's going on on the inside of our bodies? First, let's talk about what's going on. So uh, the word that refers to how bad things happen in our biological bodies is called pathophysiology. It's a compound word using uh, pathology, which is the, the study of diseases in our bodies, and physiology, which is the study of the structure and the function of our bodies, smushed together, pathophysiology. So we're talking about the study of how diseases affect the structure and function of our bodies. Pathophysiology. The pathophysiology of the common cold includes our upper respiratory tract, from your nose to your throat, uh, and getting infected by and responding to a virus. The virus does its thing, it comes in, it invades a cell, it makes uh, duplicates of itself using our own cell's biology, and then it kills the cell, releasing its uh, duplicates, its replicants, into our body. And our body does its thing by uh, detecting an invasion and signaling for help from our immune system. The immune system is very complex, made of white blood cells, chemical signals, our lymph system, etc. One of those white blood cells or, or leukocytes is called basophils. Basophils get involved and when they, when they sense that there's an invasion, they release one of their uh, most prolific chemicals, which is called histamine. Histamine is a biochemical that acts like a signal in our bodies. It, it uh, signals different things in different parts of our bodies. One of the things it signals is it tells the blood vessels near the infection in our nose and throat to open wide so other blood vessels can come and support the process, support the fight. Um, blood vessels are made of cells that are generally 
bound tight like this. But when histamine gets involved and those blood vessels dilate, uh, the, the cells are more situated like this. And so those little spaces in between helps to promote uh, white blood cells getting to the source of infection, but it also causes uh, extra fluid from our, blood from our blood to leak into that surrounding tissue. The leaking of that extra fluid into the tissue in our nose is what causes the swelling and nasal congestion. With the swelling happens that you can't breathe anymore because you've got too much fluid in those in those tissues. And that swelling also causes the sinus pressure. It causes rhinorrhea or a drippy nose where those extra fluids start to leak out of the cells into your nostrils and runs down and drips. Or it can run down the back of your throat and make your irritate your throat through something called post-nasal drip and you end up with a sore throat. But it's all coming from that same source. Those uh, the extra fluid leaking from the blood vessels causing swelling and leakage of fluid in, into the tissues. Increased sinus pressure uh, can give you a headache. Moving up here, your uh, immune system kicking up into high gear to fight infections causes you to have fatigue and malaise. Uh, coughing can come from the infection working its way down your trachea, down your windpipe to the bronchioles where it splits and down into your, your separate lungs. Uh, okay, so that's an example of what pathophysiology of an illness looks like. And this can be a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult depending on the disease and depending on how closely you look at each individual component of what your body is doing and how the disease is processing. Now that we have some idea of what's going on in our bodies, we need to know how to, to treat it. Uh, unfortunately, since a cold is a viral illness, uh, not a bacterial infection, antibiotics are of no use. Uh, and since the, it's an otherwise self-limiting and self-resolving uh, illness, meaning that is, if you don't treat it at all, the symptoms will usually go away as your body fights off the infection uh, in seven to ten days. So generally, the way that we're treating a cold is just with supportive care. A supportive care just means that you treat the symptoms for comfort and you maintain your body's uh, natural functions like nutrition, hydration, sleep, and using the bathroom. Let's talk about over-the-counter medications commonly used for supportive care in a cold and briefly look at how they work. But the first thing we need to establish is the difference between brand name products and generic name products. This is very important because you're going to see both on the shelf in the pharmacy. You're going to go in there, you're going to grab a product, and one's going to say Tylenol, and the other one's going to say Acetaminophen. And if you don't know that those are the same thing, you may end up paying a little bit more for a better looking box than for the exact same thing in a cheaper package. So let's differentiate between brand name and generic name. Generic names are really tightly regulated by the FDA. Uh, in order to reduce as much confusion as possible between all these different drug names, um, they have to vet these generic names with the FDA during the approval process to make sure that they don't, they, number one, aren't exactly the same as something else. Number two, they're not as closely related to something else uh, on the market already. Uh, brand names are not as tightly controlled as that. For instance, uh, at some point you may have heard of the brand name Mucinex. Uh, either seen it on the shelf or you've seen a commercial for it. Um, but the makers of Mucinex have 50 different products with all, that all have the name Mucinex stamped on the front of it. They've got Mucinex D, Mucinex Fast Max, uh, Mucinex Sinus Max, et cetera, et cetera. So being able to decipher what the active ingredient in the product is and which one you need depending on your symptoms is a very valuable skill to have. Because of that, I'm gonna use the generic names as we go through this and we talk about this, and, uh, and I'll highlight what the brand names are on the screen. It, it's a little bit more difficult to get through the generic names because they're harder to pronounce, they've, they've got some weird syllables in there, but over time, the more familiar with it you get, the easier it'll be, and it'll be a very valuable skill, I promise. Okay, so the last thing that we need to discuss before we jump into the actual meat of this, uh, of this video is, when do you need to skip going to the pharmacy and look at these products and go straight to the doctor? Do not pass go, go straight to the doctor. Um, if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, or a fever that gets up above 101.5, 
you need to see a doctor. If you've already started treating yourself with over-the-counter products and you get worse instead of getting better, you need to see a doctor. If you already have been diagnosed with something like asthma, COPD, uh, congestive heart failure, or any previously diagnosed pulmonary disease, I cannot recommend that you treat yourself uh, using over-the-counter products unless you know the difference between having a cold or an acute exacerbation of an uh, already diagnosed condition. So if you have these, these conditions, you need to see a doctor. If you've been told that your immune system is suppressed, like if you have HIV or if you're taking immunosuppressant medications, if you're on high-dose steroids or immune-modulating therapies, you need to see a doctor. If you're beating us all in the age game and AARP won't leave you alone and they keep sending you new pamphlets in the mail, or if you're less than nine months old and you're watching this, your bodies are not as adept at fighting off illness as other people's are. You need to see a doctor. For the rest of us with just normal, annoying, non-life-threatening symptoms, how do we treat the common cold? Well, since our symptoms vary wildly from person to person, let's just go symptom by symptom and talk about what's going on. Stuffy nose. Remember that nasal congestion comes from that extra fluid leaking into the surrounding tissue where the infection is. If we can uh, signal those blood vessels to stop leaking, the swelling goes down and you can breathe again. Medications that do that successfully ref we refer to as decongestants. Medications like uh, pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine, or oxymetazoline. Runny nose is caused by almost the exact same thing. Uh, it's the fluid leaking from your blood vessels into your nose and dripping out. Um, so generally speaking, if you treat the former, then you'll be treating the latter, the runny nose is at the same time. But if for some reason it doesn't treat it, or uh, if you just have a, a runny nose and not nasal congestion, what you can try is something called an antihistamine. You've probably heard of antihistamines. Um, by blocking the effects of the histamine at the receptors uh, on the blood vessels, we can avoid the leaks and stop the drippy nose. There are lots of antihistamines that are on the market, like diphenhydramine, chlorpheniramine, bromphenaramine, uh, azalestine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, and you'll see a bunch of different variations in combination products, but individual products over the counter, you'll likely just see chlorpheniramine and diphenhydramine are the two biggest ones. Sinus pressure is just like the other two caused by the same thing. You've got swelling in this tissue. There's not a lot of space for it to go because you've got all these bones here. So as the tissue, the soft tissue swells, it causes increased sinus pressure, which can cause a headache. If you're able to, to treat the sinus pressure, generally you'll deal with your, your sinus headache at the same time. But nevertheless, if you'd like to, you can use your, your favorite headache medication. Uh, typically, I use either acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Sore throat from a cold is usually caused by, like I said, post-nasal drip, that fluid running down your throat and irritating it. So if you're able to, again, treat the, the runny nose, you may be able to treat the sore throat too. If that doesn't work, it may not be caused by a cold. Um, nevertheless, you can use uh, pain relievers like acetaminophen or ibuprofen to help reduce the swelling and the pain in your throat. There are also sprays that contain phenol, like chlorseptic spray. Or one of my favorite things is uh, benzocaine lozenges. We're all familiar with cough drops, but uh, some of them over the counter, like Sepacol, has benzocaine in it uh, that will numb your throat, just your throat. Um, uh, you suck on it for a little while, numbs the throat, pain goes down. It's short acting, uh, but it, it really works. It's very effective. For cough, uh, generally cough is not associated with a cold, but it's possible that with enough uh, virus-laden mucus running down your throat being inhaled into your lungs, the infection could travel further down and you end up with a lower respiratory infection too. Uh, in that case, if you have a cough, you can either have a, a, a productive cough where you're actually coughing up phlegm whenever you cough. Uh, in order to help move that along, you can use something called an expectorant. Um, you drink a whole bunch of water uh, and use an expectorant like guafenicin uh, and that helps to move, it helps to adjust how much water uh, to mucus ratio is produced by the goblet cells in our bodies that, that makes mucus. Uh, if you have a non-productive cough and it's just a dry cough and you cough, 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 if it's really driving you crazy, you can use a cough suppressant, something like dextromethorphan. 
Um, or, and then, of course, we're always familiar with cough drops, right? Mentholated cough drops can help to, it feels refreshing when you inhale from that menthol uh, reaction. It can help to suppress that cough reaction for a short amount of time until your cough drop goes away. Just remember that if you're coughing things up, you actually have a productive cough, and that phlegm that's coming up is either green or it smells bad, you need to go see a doctor. That might be a sign of a, a different infection going on in your lungs. Also, if you're smelling the things that you cough up, you're going to have a bad time. Okay, so for sneezing, sneezing, strictly speaking, is not associated with a cold, just like coughing may or may not be. But if your nose gets irritated enough, if there's enough of those chemical signals in your nose saying, hey, there's an intruder, let's get rid of it, you may be sneezing. And if you get on the, the sneezing train and you're just sneeze, 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 it could drive you crazy. Um, there aren't over-the-counter medications for sneezing associated with a cold per se, but there are for other indications like allergies. So you could use an antihistamine uh, to help suppress the sneezing reflex. For malaise and low-grade fever, uh, when you have a cold, it's the natural result of your immune system kicking into gear to fight off the infection. So if you have a fever and, and you want to reduce the fever, you can use something called an antipyretic, which is the effect, not the class of medications. Um, but analgesics like acetaminophen and ibuprofen can both help to reduce a fever. But you might be asking yourself, if a fever is a natural result of your immune system, why do you want to treat it? Well, number one, it will make you feel crummy. But it's somewhat controversial whether or not suppressing a fever decreases your natural response to an infection or not. So let me just put it this way. You don't have to treat your fever uh, unless it's very high or it's persistent. Uh, high fevers can have bad outcomes and even cause seizures when they cause the brain to get too hot, usually mostly in, in kiddos when their, their uh, fevers get really high. Um, so treat a fever if you want to, but you need to see a doctor if your fever gets above 105 degrees, if it lasts longer than 48 hours, uh, if you're treating an infant who is less than three months old and they have a temperature that's higher than 100.4, 100.4, not 104, 100.4 degrees, or if you're treating an infant uh, from three to 12 months old with a temperature greater than uh, 102.2. I know those are very specific, but those are the recommended uh, temperatures. You need to go see a doctor. Uh, if it makes you feel better, if you've, uh, if you've got an infant less than 12 months old who has a fever, especially if they're having a fever and they have malaise, go see a doctor, go see a pediatrician. Speaking of pediatrician, uh, you may have noticed that I did not mention aspirin as a way to reduce a fever. Strictly speaking, you can use aspirin to reduce a fever, but you, you cannot use aspirin in children to reduce fevers, especially when they're recovering from a viral illness. Uh, it's a setup for a very specific disease called Ray syndrome. It can be life-threatening. So do not use aspirin to reduce fevers in children. Just don't use aspirin in children. Just don't. Ibuprofen and acetaminophen are, are okay. So there you have it. It's just four main things. You've got decongestants for your stuffy nose and your sinus pressure. You've got antihistamines for a runny nose, post-nasal drip, and sneezing. You've got your expectorants and your cough suppressants for cough. Uh, and then you've got analgesics for headache, fever, and sore throat. With any medication, there is a risk of a side effect um, or interactions with other medications. The reason for that is something that I'm going to get into in a later video that I'm pretty excited about. Why do medications cause side effects? Why do they all have side effects? Uh, for over-the-counter medications, it's always best to read the box and the instructions to find out exactly how you should take the med and what you should look out for. Uh, every med is very specific with lots of information. Take a little time, read what's there, keep you keep yourself and, and your, your the people you love safe. Um, but we can go over a couple highlights of side effects right here. First of all, decongestants like Sudafed and phenylephrine uh, work mostly by stimulating your cardiovascular system. They can be very stimulating in general. They can keep you awake. Um, but since you take them by mouth, or if you take them by mouth, remember they don't just affect the site where there's a problem. You take it by mouth, it goes into your body, it goes all over your body, um, and so it can stimulate the cardiovascular system all over your body. It can cause those blood vessels to constrict all over your body and increase your blood pressure. 
For most of us, that's fine. That's, that's not a problem. But if you already have clinically diagnosed high blood pressure, uh, then it could be uh, a serious scenario. It would be something that you would not be able to use decongestants on your own. But if you use the nasal spray, it only affects the blood vessels right where the spray hits in your nose, which makes it a very attractive option for, for very many people, including those people with high blood pressure and other contraindications to medications. Uh, nasal sprays are minimally absorbed into your system because they don't penetrate very deeply into the tissue that it hits. Uh, but there is one fancy side effect called rhinitis medicamentosa um, that is associated with all decongestants, but it's even more likely with the nasal sprays. It's the medical term for reflex congestion when you stop using the decongestant. That is, you, you, you clear up your congestion using the spray, but over a certain number of days your body gets used to it, and then you stop using the spray, the activity dissipates in your body, and then suddenly that tissue goes even more constricted than it was before you had the cold. It sounds strange, but there's a, a, there's a pathophysiological reason for it. I won't jump into that right now, but if you, if you stop using the, those sprays after three or five days, between three or five days, you should just skip this altogether. And three to five days is usually enough to get you through the worst of your cold. So use a nasal spray and then just stop after five days. One that I'm sure we're all already familiar with is that antihistamines can make you drowsy. First generation antihistamines like the ones typically used uh, in a runny nose from a cold don't just affect your nose, just like the decongestants, they go everywhere in your body including the ability to get into your brain into an area called the reticular activation system. Uh, in that particular area in your brain, histamine acts like a signal to keep you awake. Uh, so if the medication gets into your brain and blocks the signal of the histamine there, then that equals lights out. You get all sleepy and you try to go to sleep. So don't pop a anti first generation antihistamine and go to work unless you like to live on the exact opposite of the wild side. Uh, second generation antihistamines for seasonal allergies like Claritin, Zyrtec, and Allegra uh, don't pass into your brain, which makes them uh, non-drowsy. It doesn't really apply here, but that's what's going on. In terms of interactions with other medications, over-the-counter medications generally play nice. They don't interact with a ton of stuff, but every medication and everybody's body is, is specific. If you're already taking a series of prescription medications, before you start an over-the-counter medication, it's wise to ask your pharmacist or your doctor about how those medications interact and whether or not it's safe. What about combination confusion? So uh, earlier I mentioned brand names and how they can be confusing because they have 50 different Mucinex products contain 50 different combinations in them. Dayquil, NyQuil, Tylenol, uh, Sinus and Cold, Robitussin, blah, 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 blah. Combination cold medicines are everywhere and they're just as confusing as they are prolific. As long as you understand the concepts that we've discussed so far and how the individual medications have their individual effects, the great mystery of the combination product is unveiled. Um, you're, you should be able to grab one, look at the back of the box and say, oh, these are the active ingredients. It's got an, an analgesic in it. It's got Tylenol, uh, acetaminophen. Um, it's got a decongestant in there. It's got uh, guafenicin in there. You, so if you understand what the medications do, then a combination product can be your best friend if it's something that is really convenient for you. So, you know, nighttime variation combination products will have uh, antihistamines in it to help you sleep. Daytime versions will have uh, decongestants that will help you to stay awake. But what I recommend is that you, you just you purchase the individual medications and you use them as you have the symptoms. Take some time, look at the back of the boxes, ask your pharmacist if you forget, um, and you'll be well on your way to, to deciding what you need for you at the right time. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about today and what to do about a cold is how to prevent a cold in the first place. Preventative medicine is something in the United States that we don't do super well. I think we're much more adept and we, we, we prefer reacting to an illness instead of preventing one. But I think that culture is changing slowly over time. Okay, to, to prevent a cold, remember that this is a, an illness caused by a virus. And these viruses move most easily in droplets, tiny little drops of our, of our uh, spit that move about when we cough and talk and sneeze, sing, scream, etc. You've probably heard more about droplets since the beginning of COVID-19 than you ever cared to. 
Remember that viruses don't die as soon as the spit that they are flying in dries up. So you talk at something, the spit hits it, it lands there, the spit dries up, but then you've got temporarily living virus on your doorknobs and your phones and your keyboards and your babies and your cats and your phones, whatever. Uh, it's all it's all there. So uh, over time it will die, but if you disinfect those things on a regular basis, like your cat, always disinfect your cat, um, then you'll help to prevent spread. Speaking of disinfecting, the, the best way to prevent catching a cold is by washing your hands on a regular basis. Uh, if you're not near somebody who has a cold to breathe in those particles, then the most likely way that you're going to catch a cold is by touching things that other people are touching, touching your face. So avoid touching your face, wash your hands on a regular basis. The best way to prevent spreading a cold, uh, if you have one, is to cover your sneeze, cover your cough, wash your hands regularly, and I know this is going to ruffle some feathers, but this is where we are, so let me just talk about it because I think it's really cool. In other cultures, especially in Asian cultures, if you get a cold, if you have symptoms of an upper respiratory uh, illness, you put on a mask. You put on a mask to help protect the people around you and prevent the spread of the droplets. Uh, good masks can capture droplets from talking, coughing, whatever, and protect the people around you. One thing that I'm really hoping that we get culturally out of this whole COVID-19 phenomenon is a destigmatization of wearing a mask when you feel bad. Sure, you can wear a mask when somebody else looks like they feel bad and you don't want to catch it from them, but what about honoring and loving the people around you? Protect the people around you. If you feel like crud, put on a mask. Now, for most people, the common cold is not life-threatening. But you remember all those uh, all those reasons that you needed to go see a doctor near the beginning of the video. Those people are in a different scenario. Uh, those people are in danger. If your body isn't effect isn't effective at clearing a, an infection, it can migrate. It, you know, it can migrate down. It can become a, a viral pneumonia. Um, the fighting it can put stress uh, on organs that are already stressed. It can precipitate an acute decompensation uh, in a previously diagnosed scenario or undiagnosed. So I, I'm not saying this to scare you, but rather to inspire you, to inspire you to consider the weaker vessels in your community. Whenever you have a cold, do your part, prevent spread. That's the heart of preventative medicine. And it's something that other countries do well that we don't do well. Uh, let's move in the direction of preventing illness instead of just reacting to illness. Okay, that's it. Get out there and better understand the cold medications you need to treat your symptoms. Um, thank you so much for watching. Remember to ask your, your questions in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time. and 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 and